if we took the time and asked you all what were those questions, we'd be here all day. But uh, you, you'd have thought you'd understood it all, wouldn't you? I have no questions, but that's not the way life is, is it? We have lots of things that we don't fully understand. There's mysteries around. It's a bit of a mystery why you know, a Harry Kane signed autograph might actually do anything for anybody. But you know, <laughs> that's okay. We're all different, aren't we? And God meets with us differently. And there are things we understand and there are things we don't understand. So turn with me to Luke chapter 1. And we come to the mystery of Mary's question, how will this be? And over these next three weeks leading up to uh, through Advent, we're going to take three words, mystery, power, and presence. That's with a C and an E as opposed to this rubbish which is on the floor here. Yeah, the presence of God. And see how the story of Mary and as the angel comes and speaks with her and engages with her is worked through, but link that together with what we have been exploring in the book of Ephesians and see again how the wonderful unity of God's word, Paul isn't pulling out thoughts of his own, but that they fit within a biblical context of how God works. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 1, quite a bit, but we're also going to be looking at Ephesians and dipping into other areas of the Bible. So you'll need your Bibles with you, you'll need your brains in gear, and you'll need to have your questions ready. Okay? Luke chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus. He'll be great. And we will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. It's a mystery. Lots of mystery. How on earth and in what way does Jesus come to be born? And there are parts of our mystery which are revealed, and there are parts of the mystery which we we don't understand. Mary comes and asks this question of the angel, how? Betrothed to Joseph, a descendant of David, Mary with her own special lineage as well, a young girl living in the north of the country of Israel in Nazareth, perhaps 13, 14, 15 years of age. It's quite staggering, isn't it? That part of the mystery is that God's going to take a young lady, a young girl, in a community, in a society in which girls were unable to have any voice, where a woman's testimony was not valid in the court of law. God takes the small, the frail, the unimportant. Now, please, that doesn't mean to say that I think that girls of 12, 13, 14 are small, frail, and unimportant. They're not. But they are in the eyes of the world. They're not particularly mature. Perhaps they were in those days, and perhaps, of course, you are. But God is a mysterious God. He takes this girl who obviously has a heart for God. She is favored by him. We don't know why or how or in what way. We don't know how she expressed her love for God in that little town in Nazareth. We don't know what her parents did. We don't know anything about, really, her background or how she grew up. 
apart from this pronouncement from the angel, that she was favored. Something about her? Maybe. Or it could simply be part of the mystery that God had his hand on her. And that's part of the mystery of faith, isn't it? That God sometimes lays his hand on unexpected people. And he brings us into a journey which is mysterious, into connections with people we had never ever thought possible. And he meets with us. Part of the mystery of the way that God works. And it's so exciting. Here is Mary. And I wonder what she was doing that morning. Washing up? Washing? Tidying up the house? Was she educated? Could she read? Could she write? We don't know. But we do know she was favored by God. We know she was unmarried. Betrothed, yes, to Joseph. Engaged. And totally different from the culture in which we live, that didn't mean that they were living together. A betrothal took place between a family and another family, often an arranged marriage, and there would be no connection between the two. They may know each other, but not particularly well, but they certainly wouldn't be living together. That took place when the bridegroom was brought to the bride, which is the opposite way around to which we do it now. When the bride walks up the aisle of the church, it was a bridegroom in those days. So as a young, favored, unmarried, but betrothed girl, engaged to Moses. Okay, Joseph. (laughs) I've no idea what I said then. (laughs) Moses, did I? Oh, well. That's a mystery. (laughs) She gets the word from this angel. It's quite a frightening experience for her. You will be with child. So girls, how would it feel if you suddenly found that that was going to be your lot? How would you explain it to mum and dad? How would it change your plans? How would you explain it to Joseph? How would you understand what was going on? And one of the important parts of faith and trust in God that's worked through a relationship with Jesus is it doesn't mean life is going to be all straightforward. Jesus, early in his ministry, was to say, narrow is the gate that leads to life. Broad is the road that leads to destruction. The narrow, difficult path of faith was what Mary had exercised, but was going to exercise. As she was brought into the purposes of God in exactly the same way as everybody who is in Christ, as we've been looking at through Ephesians, who has made that commitment to love and to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, who's been made alive in Christ, is journeying with him too. Without any full understanding of where or what that journey might incorporate or include. Quite staggering, isn't it? That God should entrust this young girl with this absolutely vital part of God's plan. We don't know how much Mary understood of the Isaiah passage we read earlier and we saw that verse with the younger children. When Isaiah approaches King Ahaz, six, seven hundred years before Jesus was born, at a time when the people of Israel, God's people, were not living as God intended. 
They're engaged in Canaanite practices. They had Baals that they worshipped alongside the worship of God. And God was bringing about a judgment on his people. Ahaz wasn't a good king. He was a bad king. He was a faithless king, and yet God spoke to him through Isaiah. And there's another young person involved in Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah's son. Anybody here called Shea Jashub? Anybody fancy that as a name? It means a remnant will return. In verse 3, the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out, you and your son, Shear Jasub, to meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the washerman's field. Don't know how old Isaiah's son was. It's thought that he was a young man as well. But his name was going to be part. And God uses both Isaiah and his young son to be, as it were, both the voice of God, but also a sign alongside the words that would come. And this is a lovely way in which as we think about Advent and as we see the way that God works, that this is cross-generational ministry that God is engaging in. It's not just for the old folks, it's for everybody. And there's a part to be played for the young, for the middle-aged, and for the ancients, as we will see with Anna and Simeon. Teenagers, parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, all engaged in the process of what God is doing. But to come back into how much did Mary understand, well, the sign that came to Ahaz, this wicked king, and his people who were not following God, was that God was going to speak and say, actually, in your lifetime, before a virgin falls pregnant, gives birth, and the child is weaned, judgment's going to come. And this is going to be a sign of God with us. God's in the work of judgment and salvation. God is going to sort out and provide. So uh, Isaiah comes with the word of God, and he comes with his son, whose very name is a promise that the remnant will remain. That's what Shia Jashub means. If you look at your footnotes in Isaiah chapter 7, you and your son, a remnant will return. Go to Ahaz. So this promise that at some point in time in the near future God would act in judgment took place. Assyria wiped out that northern kingdom. And as Jesus comes and is born as Savior of the world, he comes both as Savior and as judge. Part of the mystery of the way in which God works in his world to bring about that peace and that perfection that he will bring to us. He will be called this son, Emmanuel, God with us. So let's... Right at the very start of this Advent season, knock on head the idea that Christmas is a time of fluffy cotton wool fun. It isn't. It is a wonderful exploration of the mystery of God, but it isn't sanitized. It's earthy. And God meets us in the earthiness of life as Mary is going to experience. She didn't flow through that pregnancy or the birth or the early period of Jesus' life just on a cloud. She had to live it. Joseph, too, his part was to be the same. And God says, 
six or seven hundred years earlier to the people of Israel before a baby is born or as it, before the child that is going to be born and grows up, I'm going to act in judgment. So there's a mystery which throughout Scripture is revealed. So turn with me now, just a few verse chapters on, to Isaiah 55. A great chapter in the Bible, which is an invitation to come and to find God. And it's one of the things we've been singing about, verse 9, or verse 8 actually, where Isaiah later in his life has these words for the people of God. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purposes for which I sent it. You will go out in joy, be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the pine tree, and instead of briars the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign which will not be destroyed. And right the way through our Old Testament, as the people of God go through their various experiences, God slowly reveals his plan through history. And we don't know how much of that plan Mary understood. We don't know how much she grasped and understood. How could she be the Messiah's mother? But God's ways are different from our ways. We need to grasp and understand that. That God does at times call us, as he called Mary, to walk through life in a very different path than that which was going to be just all fun. Now it does talk about being led forth in peace, about going out in joy, about the whole universe and creation That is to come. There is a faith and a trust that needs to be worked out as this mystery is revealed. So as we come to Advent, and before we turn to Ephesians, are you up for the mystery? Or do we prefer to have everything worked out for us? Do you know what you're going to get for Christmas? Do you like to know what you're going to get for Christmas? Or do you like to come down on Christmas morning and be surprised? We're all different, aren't we? And for some of us, perhaps the idea of mystery is exciting. It is for me. For others, it's scary. It's scary. And maybe it was for Mary. She was troubled. She didn't understand. But whether we are excited by mystery or whether we are fearful of mystery, that is the the realm in which God works. And ultimately, it is for our good and for his glory that we follow with him through that mystery. This is what Paul picks up in Ephesians. So turn with me now to Ephesians. We'll just pick up some of the things we've been looking at very quickly. I can't find Ephesians now. Galatians, then Ephesians. There we go. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9, Paul picks out this thought He made known to us, that is, God made known to us the mystery of his will concerning the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ. 
the mystery became known. Paul was drawn into it and he wants the Ephesian church and he wants us to realize and to see actually it's all about Jesus. It's a mystery that has been made known. In chapter 2 verse 14, the mystery is worked out. He is our peace and he has made the two one. Jew and Gentile united together so that the new community of God's people, mystery revealed for us to work out is it's a place of peace, it's a community of reconciliation, it's a community that has access to the Father. Paul picks up these themes and develops them for us. And Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3, he says, this mystery has been made known to me. How? What does it say in verse 3 of Ephesians 3? How was it made known to him? Somebody call out. By revelation. Yeah. He didn't grasp it himself. It had to be revealed to him by the Spirit of God. Because the mystery is beyond our understanding. God's ways are higher than our ways. God's thoughts are different from our thoughts. They're higher than our thoughts. And as human beings, it doesn't make sense. So by faith and by revelation, the mystery becomes clear. And then in verses 7 to 13 of chapter 3, (coughs) Paul talks about that mystery is something to share by living and by proclaiming. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery. It doesn't make sense without revelation. We're drawn into the purposes of God which we struggle to understand. And in chapter 3, in that wonderful prayer, Paul prays that the church there in Ephesus may be being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge is a mystery that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That's the mystery of the journey into which we are called. The mystery which Mary, through her willingness, if we go back to Luke chapter 1, to question, but also to trust, experience. And because it's a mystery, it's great to question. If you've got doubts, that's a healthy thing to be and to have. It's what you do with them which will answer. If you turn to God, and as she did, how will this be? She's looking to understand a little bit more. And next week we will explore and see how the Holy Spirit comes in power to enable her. But as we come towards the close, just think a little bit about what that mystery as it was revealed meant for Mary. We've touched a little bit on the embarrassment of having to talk to Joseph, of the social stigma of becoming pregnant before marriage, of carrying a child. She had no idea she was going to end up in Bethlehem. Or to have to do that journey eight or nine months pregnant. Walking to be registered. So as part of that mystery being unfolded, unfolded, revealed. And the promise of God that it would be out of the town of Bethlehem that the baby would be born. I haven't been pregnant Strangely, except by proxy. But I don't think I would fancy carrying a child 
in the later stages of pregnancy and walking that distance by, hat, by foot. Whether she was on a donkey or not, you can argue. But even on a donkey, not very comfortable. But it doesn't stop there. When she gives birth, she's away from her family network. She's away from those who would be her midwives within the community. A stranger helping to deliver her baby, perhaps. And it was a real delivery. Jesus didn't just pop out. And whereas we might like the songs like Away in a Manger, which give us this whole idea of Jesus meek and mild and no crying he makes, he cried. He was a real child. And he didn't stop there. Because as the mystery unfolds, she has the wonderful joy of seeing shepherds coming and praising and worshipping and magi from the east arriving and giving precious gifts beyond her understanding, far more than she had ever thought she could perhaps have in her home. Gold and frankincense and mirror. But then what happened next? It wasn't just a journey down to Bethlehem. It's a journey to Egypt. A journey to Egypt because her life and her child was threatened with murder. A refugee, part of the mystery of God, favored by God and yet a refugee, yes. But she went with God and God went with her. As she returns two years later, up from Egypt, back to Nazareth. She cares for him. And then at the age of 12, she loses him in, to, in Jerusalem. Lost a child in the supermarket? Or perhaps she would like to. <laughs> she was at her wit's end. I wonder how many times she thought about the prophecy that Simeon had given her that a sword will pierce your heart, soul. As the mystery of being the mother to the Son of God unfolds through his ministry. When Jesus, albeit perhaps unkindly, turns round to her and her brothers and sisters, I have no mother, no brother, no sister. I'm about my father's business. Or the experience of seeing your son taken, tried, whipped, flogged, mocked, The journey to the cross, so brutalized that he couldn't carry the crossbeam. To hear the thud as the cross is lifted up. And he left hung, waiting to die. A pain is painful death. Faith and the mystery of God. Mary, highly favored. And yet that journey for her was going to encompass a life in which she would have to trust herself through pain and through joy. to the God who had chosen and called her. No wonder Paul in Ephesians 3 prays that the church might grasp how long and how wide and how deep is the love of God. Because there are times when we go through experiences in life when we need to grasp how wonderfully deep that love is because it doesn't feel like it. 
to trust him as he entrusted himself, as Jesus himself hung on the cross to the love of a father who allowed his son to die. So it's no surprise, is it, that Jesus quite often said to people, there's a cost to following me. Take up your cross and follow me. We give up our family. We give up those things that perhaps provide us with an organized and sensible life. And we say, I'm going to walk with God. It may be that you think, why has God allowed this to happen to me? Or it may be that you look at the future and think, if I become a follower of Jesus, it does restrict my life. And it will in many ways. If you're looking for a life partner, the pool's a lot smaller in the Christian world. So what do we do? We say, well, let's give God a bit of a helping hand. We'll go on dating websites. And he says, well, actually, can you trust me? Can you trust me to bring about a mystery that I will unravel for you if it's right for you? That somehow, and the wonderful way that God works, he might be part of that. Or maybe you think, why has God allowed me to have this illness or that illness? Or why am I made as I am in my frailty and my insecurity, whatever it might be? And God said, I did that. Because I love you. And it's not the gifts and the presents. But it's the joy of being drawn into the mystery. Of not knowing what God is going to do. But finding God in the whole of life. And I think that's exciting. Scary? Yes. So no wonder there is an awful lot of fear in the nativity story. But God says, don't fear. Fear not. Trust me. Why? Because he is a God of love who knows what his purposes are for you and what his purposes are through you. And with God, there's no collateral damage. So again, I ask, are you up for the mystery? Are you willing to say through this Advent period, Lord, lots of stuff I don't understand. Help me to know your love. Reveal to me something of yourself that will keep me going. And perhaps like Mary, you'll know God's favor. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you do know the end from the beginning. Forgive us when we try to contain you and organize you. Thank you that your purposes are being worked through. And that one day, ultimately, we will enjoy that peace which passes all understanding. Until that time comes, give us the courage, the faith, the hope, and that assurance of your love and the presence of your spirit to keep us pursuing into the mysteries of a God who's made himself known 
and yet so much more to be revealed. Help us, we pray. Amen.